Hi, welcome to Astronomy Cast of an Unusual Hour. I, I, this are we is live? on me. Yeah, we're, we're oh, live. Okay. okay. Yeah, all right. Um, well, it's half on you. This could have been at 11 o'clock, and that's true. I was busy then, so now we had to go at 8 o'clock my time, yeah. 10 o'clock your time. How, how do you like mornings? Is that better for you? I'm, so I am trying to adjust my sleeping schedule because if I get up earlier in the day, I get more time that other humans aren't awake to get stuff done without interruption. Yeah. But I intrinsically hate mornings. So, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I see. I'm a morning person. I love mornings. Love them. I love <clears throat> the quiet. I love being the only person up. Um, I like that. I, part. Love, I like that. Part. I love the I love the, you know, the the phone isn't ringing. Not that the phone rings it, it ever anymore. Um, and it also naturally just as I don't know, but, you know, as I'm getting older, I'm sure the older viewers understand this. You just you wake up earlier just naturally. And so I have to go to bed earlier <clears throat> to make sure that I don't get sleep deprived. And so like I go to bed at like now I go to bed at like 930 every night and I wake up at like 530 every morning. And it's just like you're a crazy uh, person. Well, it's not cra like I, I wish I had I could do something else. I know. But no matter when I go to bed, I wake up at 530. So if I go to bed, at, <sighs> if I go to bed at, at 1130. Mm -hmm. which I could totally can do. Then I only mm -hmm. get six hours of sleep or I go to bed at midnight. You know, maybe I'll get four hours of sleep. So I've got to yeah. go to bed. I've got to go to bed early so that I can, because I'm just going to wake up early no matter what. And, yeah. and so Ned, yeah. once you figure out your, your sleep pattern and you just roll with it, then it's fine. Works for me. So, so my problem is my default sleep pattern. If you leave me completely alone and give me time to just go to bed when I want, get up when I want, I default to going to bed around three in the morning and getting up between 11 and noon. Oh no, I can't that, do that. No, nope. that that's always been my default, mm -hmm. but my husband's default is like, I'm getting ready for bed at 11. And for much of our marriage, it's just been like, I, I forfeit, I get back up, I go do shit or I go to bed after him. I, cause my body is just like, nope, <laughs> but, um, I, I am for better or worse. I pinched a nerve in my neck <clears throat> and I don't recommend that by the way. Um, but they gave me pain pills that knocked me basically unconscious. Right. And if I take those at 10, I can go to bed at a reasonable hour and get up at a reasonable hour. So apparently yeah. the only possible way for me to be a morning person is to deeply injure myself and get the good pills. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. So like, like you got to follow your natural cycle. Yeah. And my kids used to stay up later and later and later. And at one point I just said to them, like, you know, that, that time is kind of the same. Like if you stay up really late and then you sleep in really late, that's the same as you going to bed at a reasonable time and you waking up early. You get the same amount of video game time. Mm -hmm. It's just whether you do one at night or whether you do one in the morning. Mm -hmm. It didn't stick. They didn't buy it. They didn't, they didn't fall for it. But, um, but, but it's, it's funny. It's just turned out both of my kids are, you know, are now morning people. Oh, God. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll be messaging my daughter at 730 in the morning because she's up, right? So it's, it is funny how once you go through that teenage it's, I guess, Pamela, some of us never leave teenagerhood. You'll well, grow up someday. I, you know, some of us just were born to be vampires. <laughs> I guess so. And and I was the only graduate student that didn't fall asleep observing in, in my cohort. So Okay, gotta say, that is one of my greatest sadnesses, is that I am, I can't do astronomy. Like, yeah. I just, like, like I've got to do it electronically where I, you know, set all of my targets and then I go to bed and I wake up and like, here's my data because, because I'm, uh, I'm just like, you know, you know, like in the summertime, it gets dark here at like 11 o'clock. Yeah. I'm just like, Oh, sitting in front of the screen, just like passing out because that's, you have to observe at night. 
Yeah, that's I, wrong. I love seeing the sun come up in the morning from the perspective of I get to go to bed after this is over. <laughs> Because <laughs> the sun, sun rising is is a trigger to go to bed. Yeah, sunrise. Well, it, that's how I lived in grad school because I observed so much yeah. and I taught night classes. And, that's crazy. And just the the sunrise from the perspective of now I get to go to bed, you go from like the complete quiet of four a.m to the different birds waking up and it getting brighter and i just love morning from that side of things mm. i just can't do it the other way around oh, well <laughs> so. so so there you are you, you <laughs> we are we are completely utterly different on that on that spectrum it's interesting yeah. we'll see um how how things progress so well, um, we will be right. old, doddering people recording Astronomy Cast 30 years yeah. from now, and we will get totally. to see how this works out in the end game. That's exactly it. Well, I, yeah, I've see, I see my dad. I know, I know what I'm, I know what I know what a what a 30 year old version of me is going to be like. <laughs> um, so, so let's uh, let's do our job. Okay, I am finding the record buttons, uh, video is recording, uh, audio is going to demand a file name. This is episode what? Uh, 641. 641. I'm going to put on my glasses, which is ironically how I injured my neck. I have a progressive lens injury. Um, I actually just have a really bad neck from an old injury and using progressive lenses and moving my head up and down constantly <laughs> trying to figure out where the where things are in focus. I'm recording. I, are you recording? I'm, I'm now recording. This is how I injured my neck, people. Progressive <coughs> lenses do not get old. Yeah. Anyways. It's, Anyways. I'm just I'm, I'm imagining sort of like, a, like some kind of bird chicken movement as you are like working with your progressive lenses. Pretty much. All right. Pretty much. Astronomy Cast, episode 641, Are Planets Alive? Welcome to Astronomy Cast, a weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy journalist for over 20 years. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how you doing? I, I'm doing well. It's... It's weird getting to the point in our lives where various elements of our life are now 20 years old. In September, my PhD turns 20 years old. Uh, <laughs> it's just... Yes. I'm not used to this yet. <laughs> yeah. We, but haven't you noticed... I don't know. I guess this is what it feels like to be the, in the old boys club. Whatever is the astronomy equivalent of that. Like like you have connections you have references people know who you are you're able to like i don't know i'm able to reach out to people to do interviews and they're like oh fraser i've been yeah. a big fan of your work for for 10 years i'm like wait what yeah you work with this really spacecraft you know who i am and they're like yeah i'd be glad to do an interview or someone will reach out with a piece of news i'll have a source and again it's just like out of the blue and you're like wait a minute what so so be doing the same job showing up day after day for 23 <clears throat> years does have its advantages i highly encourage people to stick with something for a while if it's working for them the benefits add up over time i i agree with all of that the other side of it in astronomy is no one ever retires because they love their jobs <laughs> right yeah which yeah, means yeah. that all the people who were senior people who were hired during the apollo era when i was a graduate student they're still here mm -hmm. so i'm still mm -hmm. running into the people that met me when i was like a crazy eighth grader doing astronomy and they're still right. researchers yeah and in many cases looking out for you and sending you know interesting information your way it's 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 cool it's a it's a great community finding in pictures general. from when i was in eighth grade in their office when they clean it out that has happened it was very strange that's very weird <laughs> all right the earth is teeming with life from the upper atmosphere to kilometers underground there's no question that our planet has life but is our planet itself alive this is a question posed back in the 1970s is the guy hypothesis and got a share of criticism but some new ideas have proposed to bring this hypothesis into the modern era as we search for exoplanets and we'll talk about it in a second 
but it's time for a break. And we're back. All right, Pamela. <laughs> Like, it sounds like even like a ridiculous question. Like, <laughs> is our Earth alive? Come on. Is our planets alive? Like, they're rocks covered in this thin goo of, that is life. What does it mean to say, is a planet alive? It's so I have to start from the beginning with this episode is very much inspired by Dr. David Grinspoons. He goes by Dunkey. Dr. Funky Spoons over on Twitter and a talk he gave that we'll link to in the show notes that asks this question, is the earth alive? Is a planet alive? And the way he phrases it really got me because he, he asks the question, is life something that happens to a planet or is life something that happens on a planet? He phrases it much better in his talk. And, and he points out how with individuals, if you break things down smaller and smaller and smaller, you end up with things where it's like, can you really consider this bit of life alive? Is a molecule alive? Well, maybe if you're looking at DNA, it can replicate. Is a, is virus, a virus alive? alive? Yeah. And the smaller you get, the weirder it is to ask, is something alive? And the bigger something is, you start to run into questions like, is an ant colony a single life form or multiple life forms in the grand scheme of how it works? There are corals and many other ocean, 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 nat, many other life forms in the ocean that, uh, <laughs> Fraser's dying, <laughs> laughing at me. I gave up. I had to give up on yeah. the word. <clears throat> that, was, that, was a, that was a valiant attempt. <laughs> Oceanic, maybe? Yes, that's the word I can't say this morning. Um, there, there's uh, many life forms in the ocean that are individual bits that have gathered together to grow into structures. Fungus has this often. And so when you look at a slime mold solving a maze which part is the life form, the entirety of the slime mold or each of those little tiny single-celled organisms that are capable of reproduction into this mold. So when you start looking at a planet, it's made at the most basic level of rocks, if it's a rocky world like Earth, and a single rock, not so much alive. I, it's sort of when you think about like this idea of even just our own bodies, mm -hmm. you know, are we alive or are we just a meat suit for the bacteria that has colonized our our gut and they just are, are driving us around like some kind of mecca? That's what the, I wonder. The, the author is it me or is it the bacteria talking? <laughs> the, the author of the book, uh, Life as We Don't Know It, Peter whose name will be in the show notes. Uh, for those of you listening and not watching live, we are recording this at 10.16 uh, a.m. on a Tuesday morning. And She's, I am not, is not caffeinated enough. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, I heard him giving a talk. I loved his book, sought out a talk. And he pointed out a fact that will haunt me forever the human body has on it and inside of it more individual bacteria, microbes, other tiny life forms, parasites if you're particularly unlucky, um, eyelash, lice, um, all these other things that outnumber the number of cells that are right. created by our DNA. That's outstanding and not yeah. in a good way. All right, well, we're going to talk about, about scaling this idea up to a whole planet, but it's time for a break. And we're back. All right, so so what is the planetary version of a bacteria's meat suit? <laughs> so so what, what uh, David points out in his work, and he's working with a whole group of collaborators, um, as, as you add more and more rocks together, you get to a, a world that is capable of having essentially circulation when you look at 
the flow of heat from the core of a planet through the crust. It is capable of feedback mechanisms. And this all builds on uh, early work by Lovelock and Margulies about the Gaia hypothesis, where, where they looked at our world's ability to recover uh, chemically into a thermal equilibrium, a chemical equilibrium, over and over and over again. Catastrophes can happen and throw our system out of sorts. But over time, these different feedback mechanisms always bring us back to a stable condition. So far, Venus is, is an example of what happens when uh, you, you find a new thermo equilibrium that is not where you wish you would be. Um, but you've got all these cycles, right? You've got the carbon yeah. cycle, you've got the water cycle, you've got, you've got various air, atmospheric, earth cycles all working together, regulated perhaps by life. That is and, keeping that that as things get a little out of whack, as it gets too much carbon, then plants grow. They pull, they sequester that carbon, bring the temperature back into what makes life happy. And so, is is life calling the shots within their capability of keeping the planet where life wants it to be? And this is where it starts to get very interesting because, it, as I said, we saw on Venus it it reached a alternative point of thermo equilibrium at one point in its evolution uh, where something catastrophic happens depending on which paper you read from hundreds of millions of years ago to a couple billion years ago that took it from having an earth-like environment with perhaps vast oceans to being the uh, sulfuric acid raining hellscape we see today and yeah. same with Mars when you think about it like it got too yeah. it was too small too cold too dry but maybe again, you know, a long time ago, it was warmer and wetter, could have been covered with life. Life, again, could have been trying to keep the planet habitable for itself, and but, it couldn't keep up, and eventually it entered a new temperature regime. And, and here I think Titan may be a more interesting comparison than Mars, because Mars didn't have at any point sufficient gravity to be able to permanently hold on to all of its atmosphere and it certainly doesn't have the magnetic field necessary to hold on to its atmosphere. So life did not have the potential to hold it into an Earth-like climate. Titan does not have an Earth-like climate. It exists at the triple point of methane, where you see methane existing as a gas, a solid, and a liquid at various points within the environment. There are lakes of ethane and methane. And there has been interesting work done by Chris McKay in the past uh, looking at how some of the chemicals in the atmosphere don't appear to be in a permanent equilibrium state. They need to have things getting fed into the system. And so it raises the question of, is life on Titan uh, keeping it in a alternative equilibrium or are there geologic processes keeping hmm. it in an alternative equilibrium? And well, this just, kind of leads into my next question, which yeah. is like, like, what are the implications of this idea for the search for not only habitable worlds, but worlds that have life on them? So when you start looking at worlds that, like Earth, are in a chemical equilibrium that chemistry alone can't explain, you can't explain the oxygen in Earth's atmosphere strictly by mixing things together and letting them evolve over time and putting them in the UV of the sun's light. You instead end up with lots more carbon-based gases in, so carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, all that sort of stuff. You don't end up with the methane like we see because that breaks down in sunlight. And, and so when you start to look at a system that diverges from a, you mix the chemicals together and see what happens kind of equilibrium, you know there has to be other driving forces present. Something that is maintaining well, respiration is one way to think about it. Maintaining metabolism is the word that uh, Grinspoon used a lot. 
so we have on our world bacteria, plants, animals, everything from all the animal kingdoms that, and that's not the right word, I don't think, but from all of the kingdoms of life, we have things that are metabolizing their environment and changing the chemistry because of their life. I've got an interesting perspective because, as you know, we're we're in the process of trying to rehabilitate a, a piece of land that yeah. was logged and burned and scoured to just bare dead dirt. And and you can see this process of colonization of the various plants happening. There's certain first plants that can live almost anywhere that are able to grow and able to start. Some of them are very invasive and we need them gone. They don't come from these parts um but you know they come from their like europe uh scotch broom is the worst oh. it's just this awful terrible plant that that can take over anything and just blocks out everything and but it's a but it's a fast mover it's first in yes. and and then you can see the grasses are starting to grow and as the grasses grow you get this layer of soil and now more complicated more fragile plants are starting to grow up where all the places where the grass has been able to to get a, a foothold. And and this idea of like bio, looking for biosignatures, I think astronomers have given up at this point saying, OK, if we see methane in the atmosphere of an exoplanet, then there's life there. If we see oxygen, yeah. then there's life there. And in fact, I know we can go back to early episodes of the Astronomy Cast and you said those exact words. <laughs> If we see ozone or if we see oxygen, then there's life there. I that know. idea is hilariously simplistic now that we are now at the point where it's not just one chemical. It is a it is a mixture of, you know, a collection, a dozen that you're going to see a, a large number of individual signs in balance with each other demonstrating this this idea that this planet is alive that it is undergoing some kind of self-regulation metabolism what have you that is the signal that we're going to have to be looking for as we search for life for life beyond earth and what constantly gets me is how after past ecological disasters the kt boundary being the one that most comes to mind because I am still obsessed with the new Tamas findings. Um, our world got smacked by a large rock from space that lifted debris back up that then came back down through the atmosphere and turned our atmosphere into an oven. It baked our ecosystem, but there was enough stuff buried under the soil and deep enough down in the water that it was able to come back in and say, okay, we got the top layers of the soil, we'll repopulate. We will start over and, and make things habitable again. And it took time. And then we ended up with giant scary mammals for a while. All right, we're going to talk about this some more, but it's time for another break. And we're back. And so I wonder, like you, you talked about the the KT, the, the dinosaur killing asteroid. We've had wow. just these horrendous volcanic eruptions in the past. We've had ice ages. We've had mm -hmm. potentially horrible memory bursts hit the planet. Who knows what kinds of things. And yet the planet has always bounced back yeah. and it has always bounced back to a state of equilibrium that perfectly matches the temperature regime that the earth is in where it is in the habitable zone. Right. And it feels like that is it's like the distance from the sun is is setting the or the amount of radiation that the planet is receiving is kind of setting where that that set point is that life is going to try to reach with, I, with various boundaries. I would say the distance from the sun is aiding and abetting in picking the temperature we are at equilibrium within. Yeah. Um, it, anyone who's gotten into a car in the summer knows the greenhouse effect can be a terrible thing. And we could have reached a much higher equilibrium temperature than what we're at. I, we also could have ended up at a much lower equilibrium temperature than we're at if the conditions that drove various glaciation periods had been maintained. What is fascinating to me is life seems to be optimized for 
um, basically the tropical uh, temperature regime where you never get below freezing. Life can exist below freezing, but it's optimized for that temperature regime where you're below freezing, but it's not so hot that you have moisture baked out of every single substance. And in that temperate regime where life is able to thrive, you, you see the, the desire to take, take the planet out of equilibrium stop. But when you go colder than that, you have life trying and trying and trying, and it's outputting the kind of stuff that will gradually raise the temperatures up. And so it has taken catastrophic events in general to drop the temperatures. And hmm. then life has brought the temperatures back up to an equilibrium, and then something catastrophic happened, and right. it got dropped down. And that's one of the things that is particularly terrifying about global warming, where we're seeing temperatures in the 40s and 50s Celsius, 140s, 150s Fahrenheit. Yeah, we're seeing this in India, India right now. Oh, what a nightmare. It's yeah, it's going to destroy agriculture at a time when agriculture is being affected by so many other issues. And they don't have the infrastructure. There, there's going to be massive loss of life. And this isn't the kind of thing where the bacteria are going to be like, we are pleased. We are going to do everything we can to release gases that drop the temperature of the world. That's not a feedback mechanism we necessarily have. Um, so we we have we've gone out of equilibrium in a direction that may force us to like Venus find a new equilibrium we don't like and mm. let's not can we, can let's we not, work on let's that not try one? Let's, let's not run that experiment yeah so I guess what yeah. are the implications like what what does Grinspoon and team feel like this direction of thinking about about planets whether they're alive or not how will that help us in our science? Thinking of planets as, as systems that are metabolizing, that have reached specific levels of equilibrium, allows us to start looking at questions of uh, astrobiology more clearly. Questions of, okay, so if we have different kinds of life, what are the kinds of new equilibriums that we can reach? What are the kinds of new chemical balances we can expect to see? It allows us to ask deeper questions in terms of just how do we protect our own world where we know with a human being you have to keep certain processes in balance. Uh, your kidneys have to work or you die. You have to be able to remove the pollutants from your system. Well, with a planet, what does it take to kill a planet? how do we perform dialysis on a world like Earth? That's not a phrase that Grinspoon used, but that's the kinds of questions that seem to evolve naturally from the work that he's looking at. But, but so, could it be as, as simple, sorry, like just as checking the temperature of a planet? Like Venus yeah. and Earth are not that far apart. No. And yet Venus is like almost 300 Celsius. Right. Uh, no, it's more, more than that. Um, 150 Celsius. Anyway, it's hot, really hot, hot enough to melt lead, as they always say. And yet Earth is just a little farther away. And the yeah. average temperature on Earth is uh, like so. So Venus, very average, cool. Venus averages out at 464 degrees Celsius. That's 867 Fahrenheit. Yeah. Earth averages out at 59 Fahrenheit, which is 15 Celsius. 15 and, Celsius. Yeah. Yeah. And so, life and how much of that is life's fault that we're that planet Earth at its position in the habitable zone without life, would Earth have hit this runaway greenhouse effect like Venus and be 200 right. Celsius as opposed to 450 Celsius or never and, recovered from glaciation. Right, right. And so I wonder, like, maybe it's a very complicated like you, you you're measuring all these really complicated things or maybe it's something really simple like yeah. just the temperature is 20 degrees that there's life had to be regulating the temperature on that planet i wonder and these are the questions that we have to ask do you view a system like a planet as metabolizing and if you do, 
what does that mean? And I really think viewing a world as metabolizing allows us to say, yeah, those temperatures, those chemistries, those mean there is an ecosystem. And these other ones mean, well, that planet may still have tectonics, but its environment may have life, but the life isn't moderating the environment. Right. The life isn't, isn't in control yeah. of the planet. Yeah. Really interesting. Very cool. Well, thanks, Pamela. Thank you, Fraser. And thank you to all of our patrons out there. We, we couldn't be here without you. And as I mentioned last week, we, we know a lot of you are starting to get really affected by um, the inflation that is gripping everything. And to those of you who are still out there donating and able, we are even more grateful than, than often. Um, I mean, we're always grateful. I don't know how to yeah. phrase this. I'm going to give up and I'm just going to thank people. Uh, this week, I would like to thank Ronald McKay, uh, sorry, Ronald McCoy, Stuart Mills, Dave Massfield, uh, Helga Bjorkog, Thomas Sepstrup, Mountain Goat, Stephen Veit, Burry Gowan, Jordan Young, Kevin Lyle, Jeanette Wink, Andrew Palestra, Venkatesh Chari, Brian Cagle, David Trogue, The Giant Nothing, Aurora Leiper, David, Gerhard Schweitzer, Sir Buzz Barsek, Ronald McCoy again, uh, J.F. Rajot, uh, William Krauss, uh, Kako Sarif, Robert Palazma, Laura Kettleson, Jack Mudge, Les Howard, Joe Holstein, Frank Tippin, Adam, Adam Annis Brown, Gordon Dewis, Richard Drum, and Alexis. Thank you all so much. And thanks to you to all of you who are out there listening. We understand if you can't support the show financially that's okay. At least can you tell some folks about us? Join in the conversation, share a review. There's lots of ways to support our show and we're grateful for everyone out there who spreads the science. Thanks everyone. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. And then they saved. And they saved. All right. 641. Yeah. All right, you have to put your your number, your title at the beginning. I can do mine at the end. Right, and I'm just making sure I save things in the correct directory because otherwise I will save things to daily space, which wouldn't work so well. They don't know what to do with this. So um, we are actually going to be recording an episode of Daily Space back to back with this episode of astronomy cast so those of you on twitch just sit where you are daily space will be coming i'm going to switch over to annie hosting unless something went sideways while we were doing astronomy cast um and uh those of you who are watching over on youtube uh we will be doing daily space uh with me uh eric mattis uh, written along with Beth Johnson and uh, production by Annie Wilson and Ali Pelfrey. Uh, we're going to be doing that on twitch.tv slash CosmoQuestX. But for now, get us your questions and we'll do our best to maybe answer them. Maybe. But like, come up with hard questions. <laughs> um, all right. So Arjun says, should we be looking for planets that are the wrong temperature for its distance from the star? So I guess that's what I was getting at. Not necessarily, well, like I think when we have found many, maybe hundreds of exoplanets in the habitable zone of the star, yes, the, we will start to have surveys and there will be all of these planets that are temperatures that are, that follow like Venus or Mars dead planets that are yeah. that are the the temperature they are because of the distance from the star and and maybe the the constituents of their atmosphere and then you're going to then hopefully you'll have these weird planets that are the wrong temperature or a a reasonable Chemistry. temperature in that range in the exact same spot and so you look at these two planets these, you look at five planets four of them are 200 celsius and one of them is 15 Celsius. And then you'll know, and they all seem to have certain chemicals in their atmosphere. I guess that's what we're looking at. Or, or that maybe there'll be some uh, something else, like the amount of, of 
certain kinds of gases in their atmosphere or like just something, some way to just get a sense that there's some kind of metabolism going on that is maintaining a more reasonable world than, than what the universe would just throw randomly together. I'm, I'm super excited for the day when we can suddenly wake up and realize we have a database of detailed information on all these planets the same way that Sloan Digital Sky Survey allowed us to wake up and have massive statistically significant databases of galaxies and stars that allowed us to say this little tiny pocket is radically different from everything else. We have to explain these. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And with planets, you have that added what's triggering this can be life. With galaxies, it's often, well, it has a companion that's mucking with it. With stars, it's usually it has a companion that's mucking about it. Planets don't exactly interact with their neighbors except for like the way the moon Earth formed. So when you have an older system that, that has had a chance for things to change, um, it's really kind of amazing. The... Um... Oh, there's something I was going to say, but I forgot. So anyway, uh, Lucky DB83 says, is there a way to verify life? Not yet. We can only argue. I mean, people still argue over whether or not fire is alive. So, yeah. <laughs> no, and now I mean, like, verify if there's life on a, on a planet. And I, oh, it's going to be so hard. Like and the Venus like result people are, was the perfect example. Yeah, it really was. I've used this so many times now. Of yeah. just like like, well, how will we know if there's life? I'm like, we don't know if there's life on Venus right now. Some people think that phosphine is 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 life is comes from life. And you think about the methane result in Mars's atmosphere, yeah. same challenge. And those two planets are right here. They're just like we can send spacecraft to ex explore them directly, but like. A planet that is a hundred light years away that all we get is one pixel that we get the little rainbow from one pixel oh it's going to be so hard to to figure out whether or not there's life there so so veronica asks doesn't our atmosphere help control the temp and and this gets to be to a point so if you have cloud cover, it's going to be insulating and it's either going to be warmer if it's the winter, it's going to be hotter if it's the summer. Um, and, and so you have to a certain degree, sure, our atmosphere by itself is great. Doesn't let the UV, doesn't let the x-ray, doesn't let the gamma rays in. But on the other side, we've had all these catastrophic events over history. And the fact that we keep returning to the same equilibrium is very much driven by the chemical evolution that is driven by bacteria. And that's just kind of cool. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, yeah, like where did all that, that oxygen come from? Yeah. It all came from life. Yeah. Life pooped it all out into, into the atmosphere. Um, Steve Chisnell asks, would it make more sense to search exoplanets for spectra spectrographic signatures of industrial chemicals? Yes, but they're hard to see. Because they're not as, not as much of it as there, oxygen. There's not as much. They, they appear like a lot of those complex molecules appear in the infrared and radio, which is, I mean, infrared, great. We have JWST, but it doesn't go all the way out into the radio where a lot of the really cool molecules are. Um, so until we can get out into like sub millimeter, it's, we can start to look. We yeah. So we look. did a, we did an article on universe today within the last week or so. Um, and it was the gist being that in fact, it's going to be easier to search for technological civilizations than it will be for just biological activity exactly. in the universe exactly. because the signals are unambiguous. Whether you see the pollution in the atmosphere of a world, whether you s detect the radio signature of a message being sent your way, whether you see the, the results of, engineering mega projects as aliens are move are surrounding their stars in Dyson spheres and sending their vast armadas of light sail ships from star to star. 
those are unambiguous signals and are probably more visible are more likely to see. And so according to this research, they think that it's actually going to be more likely, even though biological life could be everywhere. When you think about all of the ice worlds here in the solar system, there could be life everywhere. And yet yeah. good luck finding it. Good luck confirming it. And yet if there was just one alien robot factory out on Enceladus pumping out, you know, with a heat signature pumping out robots, you would see that. So, yeah. um, and so it's, it could be that in fact, we see intelligent life first and everywhere before we find even one. Fraser dropped off. I don't know where Fraser went. There, yeah. you're back. Say that sentence again. You glitched. I glitched. Oh, you that glitched. that it would be more likely that we would see just technological civilizations everywhere than than fairly simple biological life forms. Just because technology has a way of 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 rearranging its environment in a way that biology can't compare. Right? You look at a city. It's humanity's impact on that landscape yeah. that defines what it looks like, not the plants that we allow to live with us. So I, I wish we had a survey telescope like JWST because JWST is going to spend the first several years of its life working on very specific problems. And while some of those problems will be doing like surveys of known planets and surveys of known galaxies, it isn't just going to be scanning the sky looking for stuff we didn't even know was out there. And if we could do an LSST kind of survey in those much, much longer wavelengths that we can't reach from the ground, mm -hmm. the possibility of uncovering stuff like Dyson spheres and things like that goes up and there's other justifications for this kind of survey but the the ability to statistically say better than we can today yeah there's no Dyson spheres out there I kind of like that concept I I think it's I think I 100% agree with you it's a, I had a chance to talk to Robin Hansen who's the who's the developer of the idea of the great filter mm -hmm. And more recently, his new research is this idea of grabby aliens, although I don't like the term. <laughs> but but they've essentially done this, this statistical analysis of, of what the universe should probably be filled with. And that essentially, if competition for resources is a thing and continues to be a thing, you will expect there will be alien civilizations out there that are harvesting or they're expanding their empire the Bobaverse. The Bob, exactly. The Bobaverse at close to the speed of light. Yeah. That they are going 80%, 90% the speed of light, going as fast as they can. And they are expanding this sphere of their influence. And because they're going, say, 80, 90% the speed of light, we'll only discover them moments before their empire washes past us. And we're now part of the Bobaverse. And, and the fact that we don't see that yet puts a number on the, the or puts a scale at the number and size of the alien civilizations are out there. And people yeah. always say, well, you know, like, well, not all aliens need to expand at 90% the speed of light gobbling up everything they can see. Sure. And they, they, and they get washed over by the ones that are that, that, you know, you can have a, a perfectly quiet, calm civilization that's just hanging out and watching TV. But, for every one of those is going to be or for every thousand of those is going to be one that wants it all. That's going to Borg up the whole galaxy. And those are the ones who will make an impact. And those are the ones that will notice. And the fact that we don't see them is it heartbreaking. Puts, well, no, it's also kind of good, <laughs> but it sets a constraint. It tells us how far apart these alien civilizations are must be otherwise well, you would yeah but I mean, like like think about how we have arrived at here in on earth yeah. on an earth that is fully populated by human beings and so you don't ask yourself like you know where is everybody 
Like everybody's everywhere and <clears throat> everywhere you go. Did. And once upon a time we did exactly. And eventually we hit a point where civilization could expand, cities could grow, people could go everywhere. And then you stopped asking that question of like, you know, is there anybody else on this world? Yeah. We know the answer to that question. And, and so there will be future civilizations that live in a post grabby alien civilization <laughs> where again, don't like the term. So where... in, instead of end stage capitalism, we have end stage colonialism at a scale that at a galactic scale. Yeah. 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 I don't yeah. want to see the Twitter rants that are going to occur about that. Well, and, I mean, you, you know, you, you don't have to call it colonial. I mean, you could call it, it's the Federation of planets that these, you know, these alien civilizations wash you by. Start they introduce... with the word grabby. I know they introduce themselves <laughs> politely. They give you the encyclopedia Galactica uh, and they move on. And you using the encyclopedia Galactica can then bring about your civilization to its best possible version of itself, so where you turn your a... planet into a Gaia and everybody transcends to a higher state of technological utopia. Sure. Fine. It, it, the point is just being that that would be obvious. You would see that. So. <laughs> So, um, yeah, we have a comment and a question coming in from Twitch that I want to bring in. So sure. Beatniks and Brubeck, you have a really cool username, uh, reminds us that Arthur C. Clarke said the universe is stranger than we can even imagine. And Q23 points, uh, asks, but how would a civilization expanding at 0.9C manage its empire to keep the expansion ongoing? Yeah. And and this is, yeah, it, it, it wouldn't, it, it would be, you have this, this expanding set of information heading outwards and heading inwards in waves where what is happening in the core, what is happening in the wings will share a common starting point, but diverge in fascinating ways over time as information propagates and gets discovered and and I need more science fiction about this, please. You start to see hints of it in things like the Foundation series. You see hints of it in um, the culture wars. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, the, you mean the like the Banks culture series. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a perfect. I think that's a perfectly valid. Like when you read about the culture. Like it is, I mean, not a, it is a post scarcity civilization where people are able to live the best possible version yeah. of themselves. They still have challenges. They still have, but they don't, they're not hungry. They don't lack for resources. They can do whatever they can imagine within the laws of physics. Yeah. And, and every second that goes by, there is suffering in on earth. There is from a from a scarcity of resources. Imagine if a civilization swept by, you know, threw down the book. Here's how to fix all those. Yeah. Bye. And then just kept going. And th that was their that was all they wanted to do was yeah. to just reach every possible world and quickly give them the the book of secrets that would help them overcome all of the hardships of their society and bring their world back to peace and safety and harmony like like what those aliens do you it's just that they would that someone will put it in their mind to do it yeah and off they go and it's the ones that do it are the ones that are visible as opposed to the ones that don't do it and, and you know i mean obviously we can throw all kinds of of meaning and and you know we can decide the good thing bad thing morality ethics etc but it's just, it's just life doing what life does. It's like I said, more science fiction plays. These are yeah, the yeah. these are the questions that really get explored by people who are thinking deeply about um, all the cultural and technological questions. And science fiction writers are running a different kind of simulation than cosmologists. And right. um, I love how the two fields of the fiction writers and the, the scientists feed on each other to try and make dreams possible. 
and then taking those newest discoveries and turning them into new and possible things. Well, there is, I mean, even like science fiction helps us get a sense for, for how things can go wrong as well and yeah, try to get us yeah. working to try and prevent them. A good example of this is like, is in artificial intelligence, you've got this, you know, we think about terminators, we think of like we create right. artificial super intelligence and then they, they enslave humanity and away they go. And that's a staple in science fiction. Well, yeah. the reality is, is that, that how do we control something that's smarter than us? is an unsolved yes. problem in computer science. Yeah. And there are whole feet there's a whole field called called the control problem. And it is really tricky to, and no one has solved this. No one has come up with a satisfying answer to how do you control something that you've made that is smarter than you are. And that at least just like to to have it do to know why it's doing what it's doing and to have it do things for the benefit of humanity and not just turn us all into paper clips. Yeah. And, yeah. and so science fiction plays a beautiful role. And just the fact that it's even in people's minds is thanks to science fiction authors going, go, what if this goes wrong? Right. <laughs> then, then scientists can go, whoo, you know, this is starting <laughs> to feel like that, that, that movie I watched with the Terminator. Well, the, what I'm working on, I mean, it's, uh, it's science fiction is, is so valuable. Yeah, I, to, I'm currently these ideas. I'm currently rereading the Three Body Problem series mm -hmm. by Chiak Sin Yu, and mm -hmm. I'm I. You can say the name. I don't remember how to say it correctly. Chi Xin Liu. Yes, and and it's another one of the ones that that starts to ask questions like would we even be fully aware of sufficiently advanced technology or would we be like ants trying to understand the civilization around us and the second book in the series starts in this with this fabulous back and forth scene between an ant climbing up a gravestone and experiencing the textures and patterns of the letters, but not understanding what they are any more than it understands the shape of the thorax of the grasshopper it has eaten. At, yeah. at the same time, though, you have the humans around it, and these are as understandable as a volcano would be. Yeah. Um, it's, it's yep. really Yeah, the... Uh, the the, the first book is mediocre yeah and in, and better. in fact and a little um problematic there's a few like uh references to Uyghurs and and like there's a, there, yeah. if you read that book with a very critical eye to the CCP and and just like what's happening in Chinese society yeah. you're gonna be kind of squicked out um the second book is better and 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 sort of more deals with and the first book gets science better fiction. if you can slog through the first half yeah yeah it improves yeah and but there's you know there's sort of a different problematic issue that's that's i don't want to spoil it but i you know i i would definitely have a i have some pretty significant bones to pick with and it could just be the translation you know i haven't read it in the original chinese yet um yes. and then the third book is just a mind-blowing adventure that like if you like you're halfway through the second book right now yeah the third book just goes times infinity it's yeah it's the craziest thing so you will uh you will enjoy the the third <sighs> book as well but yeah. definitely read if you do read the book the books uh to keep in mind that it's it also has some very problematic ideas so and and the foundation series is super problematic oh yeah and, to a, and, a lot of these you know older books for sure and what apple tv was able to do with the foundation series was mind-blowing i love that that i i can't wait to see more of where they go with this show and with netflix uh getting ready to put out three body problem i'm really looking forward to seeing how does it change given a chance to be yeah. interpreted outside of the potential penalties of being written in China? Yeah, but it'll be interesting. Like, like it is, you know, the, the series is a, he's a superstar in China and yeah. it is it is one of the pieces of literature that they are most proud of. And so 
they uh like for a western i guess for a western company to adapt the show or adapt the book in a way that would not pass the censors back in china <laughs> <laughs> that's gonna get weird um yeah, yeah so i you know and at the same time there like i know there's a there's a chinese adaptation is coming and there's also the netflix adaptation and so we'll see sort of what what happens but um yeah it's a funny time it's a weird time for everything all the time anyway it's... yeah yeah, yeah. okay so, so we we've reached we... the end of our hour and you need to switch over to daily space right so we are sort of all set up i'm gonna have to blink the stream for all of you over on twitch to go from the output for astronomy cast to the output for uh daily space so those of you watching on youtube feel free to click on over to twitch.tv slash cosmo quest x uh those of you already there just stay put um and uh today's bye. huh <laughs> bye to me yeah mm -hmm. i was gonna say so we're about to record an episode that starts with some cool supernova science uh what do you have coming up uh, oh, um, so tomorrow I have an interview with a researcher from NASA who is working on testing out melt probes in Greenland to get through the ice to study the under the subsurface lakes. That's and cool. so, yeah. And so a lot of people have been asking, like, could we could, would this really work on Europa? And the science of this is surprisingly mature. And we're going to talk about that, just how it works, what it's going to take to be able to do this on Europa and how we could find life on some of these ice worlds out across the solar system. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited. That's, that's absolutely awesome. Okay, so I am going to switch us over to the Astronomy Cast logo, blink the stream and hopefully come back healthy with rockets. So goodbye everyone, but only for a few seconds. So stay put or switch over to Twitch and we will see you on the other side.